One of the most fascinating additions to the RP2040 is the Programmable Input Output, or PIO. There is a lot to unpack when it comes to using the PIO, but I'd like to show you how you can get started with it in MicroPython. The RP2040 is a microcontroller. It's similar to many other microcontrollers on the market, but it's got a few important differences. First of all, it has no onboard flash memory for storing programs, so you'll have to add your own flash in a separate chip. Next, it uses a dual-core ARM Cortex-M0+. These run up to 133 MHz, which is really fast compared to many of the other Cortex-M0 Plus chips out there. The two cores allow us to do things concurrently, like run wireless stacks if you have access to a transceiver, or process data separately from your main program. This is great for things like digital signal processing or embedded machine learning. Like other microcontrollers, the RP2040 has a number of built-in peripherals. Some of these include communication protocols like UART, SPI, I2C, and so on, along with four analog to digital pins. There are more peripherals than what I listed here, but these are the basic ones. You'll find that the RP2040 does not come with any advanced peripherals like I2S, SD card, or CAN bus. Instead, it gives us these new programmable input-output peripherals on the chip. Each RP2040 has two PIO instances. The idea behind PIO is to allow users to create tiny programs that emulate these more advanced peripherals that aren't on the chip. These tiny programs run on the PIO completely independent of the main processing cores. In effect, we must bit bang the protocols with PIO, but it won't take up any CPU time. Other microcontrollers have accomplished something similar by providing programmable hardware like a tiny FPGA alongside the CPU, but this is the first time I've seen a chip have reconfigurable peripherals using sequential code. They're kind of like miniature, very limited coprocessors that are intended to handle communication protocols. Some folks have already used the PIO to create things like DVI drivers to turn the Pico into a BBC micro emulator to play old video games or short video clips. This does require overclocking the board though. The RP2040 datasheet has a great block diagram showing the inner workings of the PIO. This is a single PIO instance. Remember, we have two of these on the RP2040. Each PIO has four state machines. A state machine is kind of like a tiny processor with very limited capabilities. Each one can run some instructions concurrently with the others. However, they all share instruction memory. You can't have more than 32 assembly instructions for a grouping of four state machines in a single PIO instance. Each state machine has two FIFOs, which are essentially buffers that can be used to send and receive data to and from the main ARM processor. The state machines can be configured to control any consecutive group of GPIO pins on the RP2040. The state machines also have access to interrupts, which can be used to synchronize execution among each other or with the main program on the CPU. Here is what one of the state machines looks like. There are two places to store data going to and coming from the main CPU program. Each state machine has its own program counter, which means it can execute in a different section of the same code that's shared with the other three state machines in a single PIO. There are two working registers, X and Y. Each is 32 bits wide. And there's a clock divider, which makes it so you can run the state machine at anywhere between about 2 kilohertz and 133 megahertz, assuming we don't overclock it. Each state machine has its own divider, so they can all run at different speeds. There's a control section, like you would find in any processor. However, there's no arithmetic logic unit, which makes this different from other processors. PIO programs use this special assembly language consisting of nine instructions. As you can see, there are no generic math functions. Everything here is intended to help you move data around for the different communication protocols rather than doing math. If you are looking to create your own PIO programs, I highly recommend reading through this section of the RP2040 datasheet. It goes over what each of the assembly instructions does and how to use them to create your own communication peripherals. The Raspberry Pi Pico Python SDK is another great resource. Section 3.9 shows you how to make PIO programs in MicroPython. Let's create a simple PIO program in MicroPython to blink an LED so you can see this in action. 
We'll start with a blank Python program in Thonny. As before, we'll import the machine and uTime modules. We'll also want to import RP2, which is a library that gives us access to some unique RP2040 functions like the PIO. Next, we need to create a new function for our PIO program. We use a decorator inside the RP2 module in order to use the special PIO assembly language. We can define consecutive pins in the decorator's parameters, but we tell the program which pin to start at when we create a state machine object. For example, if pin 25 is our base pin, we can use more than one pin by defining a tuple with pin configurations. Here, if pin 25 is our base pin, that pin would be an output and start low, and pin 26 would be the next consecutive pin and be an output that starts high. For our Blinky program, we only need one pin, so we can remove the tuple and just define the direction of the base pin. We'll define our program and name it Blink. A wrap target is like a label. We're allowed one free jump per state machine, which is known as a wrap. Whenever the program counter of the state machine reaches the end of the program or a wrap command, it jumps to our wrap target, allowing us to loop forever. We could use a regular jump instruction, but that costs us an instruction cycle. Wrap jumps automatically. Next, we'll call the set function in Python, which calls the set PIO assembly instruction. The first argument, pins, means that we're writing to GPIO. Since we defined only one pin in the decorator arguments, that should correspond to just our base pin. The second argument is what value we want to write to the destination. In this case, we're setting the GPIO to logic high. We can have the state machine delay for up to 31 cycles just after performing the instruction. Note that each instruction takes exactly one clock cycle to perform. However, remember that state machine clocks can be divided, and we plan to run the state machine at 2 kHz instead of the system speed of 125 MHz, which is the default for the Pico. We'll have the state machine delay for 19 cycles after the set instruction, giving us a total of 20 cycles to execute this line. Note that the wrap and wrap target lines do not execute as PIO instructions. They just tell the program counter where to reset when it's reached the end, which costs us no cycles. Notice that all of these PIO assembly instructions and labels look like Python commands. If you take a look at the RP2 module in the MicroPython source code, you can see how each PIO instruction is wrapped in a Python function call. Feel free to look at this code to get an idea of what functions are available for writing a PIO program. Next, we'll add in four no-op instructions, each with an extra 19 cycles of delay. No-op stands for no operation and is essentially just a delay for the processor. There is no actual no-op command in PIO assembly. Rather, the state machine just moves whatever is in the Y scratch register back into the Y register, accomplishing nothing. So we set the base pin high and then wait for a total of 99 cycles after that, giving us a total of 100 cycles at 2 kHz. That should give us 0.05 seconds for this part. Let's do the same thing, but this time we set our base pin to zero, meaning we turn it off. That gives us 0.1 second for one full cycle, which should be a 10 hertz blink rate. We'll make sure to end with a wrap function to tell the state machine to start over at our wrap target label. Next, we'll create our state machine object, which we do by calling the state machine method function in RP2. The first parameter is which of the eight state machines we wish to use. As far as I can tell, state machines 0 through 3 run in PIO 0, and state machines 4 through 7 run in PIO 1. Next, we tell the state machine which program to run. We'll give it the name of the program we just wrote. We then set the frequency we want the machine to run at, which will automatically calculate the divider for us. We can't really go below 2000 Hz, so let's use that. Finally, we set the base pin, which will be GPIO 25 for us, as that's the LED pin. Then, we'll create our main loop. We'll print something to the console and then start the state machine by calling the active method function and setting it to 1. We'll sleep for 1 second and then stop the state machine. This should demonstrate how to control the state machine from your main program. Let's run this on our Pico. As you can see, the main loop is running, starting and stopping the state machine. The state machine program runs independently of what's going on in our main program. 
As you can see, the LED blinks rapidly for one second and then stops blinking for one second whenever the state machine is off. The LED may stay on or off during that time. It all depends on when the active zero command was given in our main program. I hope this gives you a start with using PIO, but I know that I'll probably be using other people's PIO drivers rather than writing my own. So let me show you how you can do that. Let's say you find some PIO code. The Pico MicroPython examples GitHub repository is a good place to start. Let's take a look at the PIO PWM example. You're welcome to use this whole program as is, but let's make it a library. So we copy everything to start. In Thawney, we'll paste it into a new program. Let's cut out the example part at the bottom, and we can delete the time module import since we don't need it. We'll save it as piopwm.py in the lib folder on our Pico. I'm going to create a new document that will act as my main program. Here, I'll import the uTime module as well as the piopwm class from the piopwm module we just created. We'll create a new PIO PWM object using the init function from the module. We give it the state machine number, which pin to use, and set the max count of the PWM as well as the frequency of the state machine. In loop, I'll create something like the test code we cut out earlier, but I'll modify it so that it fades in and out. We'll use a simple for loop to count from 0 to 255. Next, we call the set function we defined in the new library to set the pulse width modulation threshold of our PIO program. Then, we sleep for a short amount of time. To fade out, we do the same thing, but in reverse. Let's upload this to our Pico. The onboard LED should be slowly fading in and out. In the future, I imagine we'll have easier ways to install PIO libraries on the Pico, but copying in code to a custom module is what we have to work with for now. There's a lot I didn't cover, but I hope this has helped you get started using this funky new PIO system on the RP2040. I highly recommend reading the datasheets if you'd like to create your own PIO programs. Good luck and happy hacking.